This is a preventable disease. We know it's an environmental exposure. It has to be. Genes do not cause epidemics. These are kids who, many of them, were fully functional and regressed because of some environmental exposure into autism when they're two years old. The statements that were made pretty much dismiss any possibility that autism has a genetic component. We know that autism is highly heritable. We know that it runs in families. And there are at least 100 genes for which if you have a variation in those genes, you have a high likelihood of having an autism diagnosis. Therefore, in some cases, genetics directly cause the autism. So there is also another huge component, which where there are could be multiple environmental factors, not one, as, as was kind of insinuated, but there are multiple environmental factors along with multiple genetics. And so I think that um, the statements made were kind of oversimplified the nature of autism. It's a very complex condition and it affects people in different ways. So some people may have impairments in one area and other people may have, you know, be completely fine in that area and in fact um, have abilities that are, are not seen in people without autism. So it's very dangerous to say that one thing causes autism. We, do, we know that to not be the case, that there are, it's a complex interaction of many things. One of the things that I think that we need to move away from today is this, uh, is this ideology that, this, that the autism diagnosis, that the autism prevalence increases, the relentless increases, are simply artifacts of better diagnoses, better recognition, or changing diagnostic criteria. If you look at table three of the ADDM report, it's clear that the rates are real. So this, the, so the MNWR report that was published is the clearest data to date that shows that there are factors like access to services, diagnoses, the changing diagnoses over time, um, and even diagnostic substitution, which means that some people who were diagnosed with what was known as intellectual disability 20 years ago may now be diagnosed with autism now. So those three things, um, this report shows the strongest, those, are the, that's, those things are the strongest drivers of the increase in prevalence over time. You can see this in the data itself. You're seeing changes in prevalence in historically underrepresented groups like Black and Hispanics, and even those with low socioeconomic status. You're seeing even that there are more evaluations made in the last few years that were made even prior to COVID. So we're seeing more evaluations being made, and then also these changing diagnostic factors. And these things have been shown in previous scientific literature to have a strong influence on prevalence. So this isn't something that just came up in the last week. This is something that scientists have known for a while. There are small slivers of the autism epidemic, maybe 10% to 25% according to the studies. The highest studies are around 25%. That can be attributed to, to uh, better recognition and better diagnosis. Uh, that means 85% are, are, are still, or 75% to 80% are still are part of an epidemic, and that's too many. 85% of the diagnosis is due to the environment. That is not true. That was actually misquoted from um, an article that he cited. There's a recent study by Blaxel et al. and a team of other researchers that said that the cost of treating autism in this country by 2035, so within 10 years, will be a trillion dollars a year. That study was retracted. So I don't think we can rely on that study to, to have, any, have any weight. Autism destroys families. And more importantly, it destroys our greatest resource, which are our children. And these are kids who will never pay taxes. They'll never hold a job. They'll never play baseball. They'll never write a poem. They'll never go out on a date. Many of them will never use a toilet unassisted. And we have to recognize we are doing this to our children. So the reality is, is that autism is being oversimplified. 
right now. So autism is actually a very diverse condition. So there are individuals for which um, the, they are minimally verbal. They have severe cognitive disabilities. They may never live independently. Um, they may never have a job that pays taxes. That doesn't impact their meaning in life. They are still important and they're still valued. There's also individuals with autism that can live independently, that may go to college, that have competitive jobs, that can pay their own bills. Um, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean that their problems are less important. It means that they're different and we shouldn't be categorizing this broad spectrum of autism with such a narrow, um, with, with, with such a narrow comment, right? There are some people for which um, they will never pay taxes or the diagnosis is devastating in others or in which you want features to be prevented. Some features of autism, like you want people to be able to speak, right? You don't want people to not be able to communicate. But for other people, some of some of the features of autism, they don't want prevented. I think it's it's kind of irresponsible to put everybody with autism into one broad umbrella when it comes to what individual families need and don't need, because that's highly variable.